my name is Joe Minicosi. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. And when I talk about cities, I often have to come up with an analogy to get folks to understand cities as places and time. And the easiest way for me to do that is to talk about ourselves or people. Cities are just collections of people. So if you want to see how I started my life, this is how I started my life when I had hair, when I was three months old, and this is my trajectory. I'm going to be my grandfather, whether I like it or not, or more importantly, I'm going to be this guy, my father. So I have a genetic issue with two of them, actually. I'm genetically Italian, but we also have a genetic predisposition to heart disease in my family. So I know that I have to deal with that. That's information that I have. It's information that I collect from my family, and I have to work with it, right? So I have to exercise and eat right and do all that stuff. So cities are no different. Who's your father and grandfather or grandmother or, grand, uh, or mom? How, who's your city's place where you're going in the future? There's good things and bad things you can learn about places. In Asheville, we talk a lot about Atlanta. There's not a million years we're going to be Atlanta, but we learn their heart attack and don't repeat it. So Asheville is where I live. Um, it's about four hours northeast of Atlanta, uh, where the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Smoky Mountains are nearby, Blue Ridge Parkway, bluegrass music, beer. We have 40 breweries. 40, 40 in Asheville. That's about 2,500 people per brewery if you're doing the math on that. Uh, we drink a lot, and like any quirky little mountain town, we have men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little place. Well, Asheville didn't start that way. It actually became the second largest city in North Carolina and then fell flat on its face uh, in the Depression and never really came back. Uh, we had the highest debt per capita of the entire United States in 1928. When our books were audited, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank, a little clerical error there. And our entire city council was indicted and our mayor committed suicide. That's how we entered the Depression. We call that leadership in Asheville. Um, but anyway, this is our city. We essentially mothballed it and it sat fallow uh, for a couple of decades. And that's a 1996 Chevy Celebrity right there in that picture. That's not too long ago. So why don't you move to Asheville and put some put some elbow grease into fixing that puppy up, right? You know, so we had this attitude in our community that we just walked away from this environment. This isn't who we are, we've modernized, we're rural mountain people, we're, don't, we're not city people, that's not who we are, we're not from New Orleans, we're different people. And what we failed to recognize is this, cities have always been with us as places and time. So I used to work with uh, Public Interest Projects, which is a for-profit real estate development company based in Asheville. Julian Price inherited a lot of money and put $15 million into fixing a building, fixing buildings. So our job was putting money into fixing buildings and starting businesses, things on the ground floor and stuff like that. So this is one of our buildings before and after, real rocket science. We just basically peeled the skin off and reactivated this old hotel as apartments. These are four to 500 square foot apartments. Um, let me ask this audience, who would live in a four to 500 square foot apartment? Maybe three people? Four? Three and a half. I'll give you a half on that one. Let me change the question. Who in this room has lived in a four to 500 square foot apartment in your lifetime? That was our marketing survey. So rather than thinking about where we were, we thought about what our community is. We're, we're 90,000 people. Surely there's 24 people that want to live downtown. And they've been 99% leased up ever since. We fail to recognize the, the existing marketplace that's in the community because we don't look at the data. We're not paying attention to the information that's out there. Our role in our community was constantly bringing information out. So here's uh, the value of our downtown. In, in 1991, our downtown as a portfolio of buildings was worth $100 million, right? We're a $15 million investor sitting inside that $100 million pool. And this, all these buildings are worth something, right? So, so that's, that's the value. Asheville didn't get a new building in downtown until 2008. So what you see there in the growth in that chart is all by uncorking those upper stories, allowing those upper stories to get used. They pay taxes, right? If you're not using them, they're lower value. So to show you that it's not all love and roses in Asheville, uh, these are actual campaign ads from the 1990s. Uh, this is this guy, Chris Peterson, complaining about the city doing parking garages and streetscape projects. So $26 million of public investment into the downtown. This guy was upset about it. $26 million is a lot of money. I like this. Downtown development for bureaucrats instead of water, sewer, streets for our citizens. So, fair enough. You know, Chris is a naysayer. He thinks that this is a subsidy into the downtown. But let's do some math here. If you invest $26 million on a $100 million asset and it grows to $500 million, is investing 26 and yielding 430 is that a good return on investment? Do it all day long. Yeah. 
Why do we listen to Chris? You're not going to stop Chris either. Chris has a website now with fire and brimstone. I love this. Um, he misspelled charlatans. Uh, this is the mayor right here. And I'm like, I'm like, mayor, is that a liquor drink? She goes, it should be. You know, it just, Chris is entitled to his opinion. He's not entitled to facts. And we've gotten into this world of not talking about the data that's out there. Instead, we talk about what we believe cities are, what our theories are, what we think are happening. Let's, let's just look at the data first. So in 2009, I went to a planning conference. It was about smart growth. And I had this slide up to the audience. And I'll ask you all. Um, I stood before the audience and I said, so who in this room has read your local tax assessment policy and how your taxes work? Anybody? Anybody? We've got... Well, I just want to know, like, the assessment. Do you know how a building is assessed, the policies? We've got three people, maybe, in this room here. You all live in these economic models, right? So I'm standing before a bunch of planners, and I had this, this, this text up. I'm trained as an architect. I like to look at pictures. I don't like to read tax policy. But I read ours. I've read in your community. I've read yours as well. If we're not choosing to read this stuff, we're essentially functionally illiterate on how our cities operate. There's a cash flow to all of this stuff, right? So what I found is that we've kind, of, we've kind of disengaged ourselves from a level of civic and civic understanding because of our biases or the way that we think things operate. This is a kid's book that I found in a garage sale. And in the book, it's the city, the town, and the country, right? City, town, country. City, town, country. This is the teacher's guide. This is a 1959 textbook in third grade. So in kindergarten, you learn about your house. First grade, the school. Second grade, the neighborhood. Third grade, you learn about regional planning. Did y'all do that? In the book, The Teacher's Guide, to work with you all on how to deal with these third graders, it says things like this. While patterns vary from state to state, counties are responsible for education, library, health, welfare, et cetera. In studying the functions performed by your county, you will no doubt find there's a duplication of services and overlapping of jurisdictions and a lack of coordination between the county and the communities within it. Now, I understand in New England, your counties are a little bit less significant than in the South, but do you have a healthy coordination between the two? Is the county helping out with the cleaning up Main Street over here? Why aren't these things connected? And we've just allowed this ability by not paying attention to our government or our processes or reading policies to understand what's going on. But, and this is the lesson. It's one of those Dick and Jane things. Um, you can see what's happening. There's a new factory gets built. There's even more kids that go to school, right? And you can see what's going on in the picture. It's painfully white. It's also super misogynistic. The girls are shoved out in the hallway for some reason. But in blue, <laughs> This is what you ask your third graders in blue, right? Give four good reasons for building a new school. And what do your third graders talk about? Equity, maybe everybody should have a desk. How about fitting everybody in the classroom? Maybe get a second teacher, that's called infrastructure, right? Your third graders are talking about community need. On the right-hand side of the page, you read about Mr. Canfield, who lived next door to the Allens. He didn't want a new school. He says, our taxes are too high now. If we build a new school, we'll need more teachers and everything else, and we'll have to pay still higher taxes. That is indeed true. So you ask your third graders up here on the top, give four good reasons, or why are some people against paying higher taxes? So we talk about need and cost all in the same thing. And you've got to work together. Third graders are working this out. You can't have it on one side or the other. We get people that just don't want to pay taxes. It's like, yeah, sure. I want a completely free government, too. Like, we're a country that is formed on a tax revolt. There's a great um, colonial barb that we used to say when we were colonists. Don't tax me. Don't tax thee. Tax the fellow behind the tree. We're a country of tax evaders. I get it. You know, but we have to pay for that road, that sidewalk, the school, and all this other stuff. There's needs in our community. So what I found with this, and this is my favorite part, remember too, whether urban and rural and regardless of region, your tr children are tragically limited in their knowledge of their world and their world's the space in which they live and operate. We have all become tragically limited in our understanding of the community. For anybody that's a, a counselor or alderman who's run for office, you hear people talk about this stuff, like I need a better parking space. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, should we just bend the whole city for your parking space? But we do this. We meet individualistic needs without understanding the common need of the community. So for me, a city is a finite boundary of land that has to be managed, it has to have services, and it has to be um, engaged economically. My city, actually in the state of North Carolina, my state made it illegal for my city to annex land until December 26, 2026. Um, so if you ever want to have some fun, come try North Carolina politics. We don't have what you all have here, which is you have towns right up against each other. So my city is floating in this big sea of county sprawl that we're servicing and getting no taxes. 
but that land area that we do control is all the land that we have. So think of it as like one really big real estate development project, right? That you have to put streets to, pipes, and all of that stuff. Now we're all in it together. If you look up the word incorporate out of the Oxford American Dictionary, it says to constitute a company, a city, or other organization as a legal corporation. So by law, we're all shareholders in this corporation together. So y'all are all shareholders in Hillsborough County and also Manchester, right? And it's not just your city and your county, it's your state, your shareholders in your state, right? You pay state taxes. We're also shareholders in the country. Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. It's like midnight, I'm watching this happen. I was like, oh my God, so I went and looked it up. This is the US code right here that lists us as a federal corporation. It doesn't say that we're a capitalistic corporation, we are a social corporation. We're all in this together, there's a cash flow to this stuff. Do y'all follow me? So this is how we run our communities. We have to pay for things. So my city at $12.8 billion of taxable value is six times the value of Ted Turner. Does Ted Turner wake up every single day and look at Facebook and that's how he's deciding his business? Of course not. He's looking at the capital of all this stuff and what happens. So when we talk to our elected officials, we're like, look, we need to understand the cost of this stuff. We need to pay for the things for those of us that can't afford other aspects of our community. We have to lift up the rising tide of all bottom of our, of our bucket. So we need to understand the productivity of these buildings. And when you talk to farmers, farmers always talk in cash flow. They're always talking about the economics, the water per acre, the fertilizer per acre, the labor per acre. They're not just going out and tilling all of the soil. They're doing economic analysis. So this is one of our buildings. This is the streetscape project that Chris got all upset about. So thank you, city. Thanks, city, for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and a street tree. Thanks for that gift at our front door, right? We didn't pay for that. We put in retail, office, and residential up top on the top floor floors. The taxable value went from $300,000 to $11 million. So the taxes on that property shot up 3,500%, right? That's taxes y'all get. Go out and buy 3,500% more garbage cans. I don't care. You know, do some things with this investment. Cultivate our community's wealth. Do y'all have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Wouldn't you like that? This is our community's wealth. We're building our community's wealth. And people are like, well, Joe, that's not fair. We've got this Walmart over here at 20 million. Fair enough, that Walmart's double the value of our building. But it's not a fair way of analyzing it because that Walmart took 34 acres of my corporation to make happen. Our building's on 0.2 acres. It'll fit in most of yours front yard, right? That's not an apples to apples comparison. So when you look at it per acre, what does our building yield per acre versus their building yield per acre? This is what we pay in taxes per acre versus them. Would you have thought that our building was 100 times more tax productive than a Walmart? It is. And that's where it stops for y'all. In North Carolina, we pay retail taxes, and I have to deal with people that are just like, well, Joe, we take the losses and property taxes to get the retail taxes. Like, all right, let's measure it. So we're paying double the retail taxes. Who would have thought that a furniture store and a tattoo shop was paying double the taxes of Walmart? We are. Um, residents, we got nine units of residential per acre, and we've got more jobs. So let's talk about the economics of this. Who's paying their retail employee more per, per hour? Us or the Walmart people? Probably us. It might be a nickel, it might be a dime more, but it's still gonna be more. Now who's hiring the local web designer, the local attorney, the local accountant? Our side of the ledger or the red side of the ledger? So let's understand what's happening in our community. If we're not supporting other businesses, if we're not investing in other businesses and investing in our taxes, we're devaluing our corporation. We're squandering this asset, right? Now I was presenting this in Colorado. I was like, let me make this real easy for you people in Colorado. If you could grow something, what are you gonna grow? Cash crops, right? We get this. You do it in Massachusetts too, I guess. Not here. Anyway. Some people are like, Joe, what's your problem? Do you hate Walmart? Like, why are you so anti-Walmart? And if that's what you're thinking right now, you're missing the point. This isn't about Walmart. This is about the system of our taxation. This is about the game of the economics that's out there, and you have to be literate about it. So I presented at the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference. Anybody hang out with a bunch of assessors? Could you imagine 3,000 of them? It makes a planning conference feel like Bernie Man. It was like the squarest conference I've ever been to. And so there's like 3,000 assessors. This guy gets up and does the keynote address at eight o'clock in the morning. It presents spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet on how cheap his buildings are. I'm in the back of the room watching this all go down. I'm like, this is awesome. Like how smart is that? You've got 3,000 assessors. In one meeting, you're getting all of your property tax bills lowered. 
Assessors are agnostic. If it's a cheap throwaway building, it's a cheap throwaway building. When you tax on value, there is a perverse incentive for me to build junk in your community, period. It's that simple. Assessors can't make value that doesn't exist there. So they're like, okay, thank you very much. There goes all the property tax bills. So I'm having a coronary. I'm like, how is he getting away with this? You know, so I, I went up to the microphone and I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? And he, and I'm not making this up. He goes, 15 years, maybe 20 years. We designed the building to depreciate it as fast as possible. We'll build another building to depreciate it down again. The buildings are throwaway for us. We just have a network of distribution. The buildings are cast-offs from the mouth of babes. When you, when you do the system, people are going to figure it out. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Or, as a community, decide we want a 15-year relationship with an asset, and that's good enough for us, which is about the life cycle of a cat. You know, I'm a dog person. This is the commitment of that piece of architecture. Did any of these buildings that your great-grandparents left you, like this one that we're in right now, have that same thought? Of course not. It was a different civic action back then. So I've breezed through a lot of information, and what I'm trying to set up here is a form of analytics to understand productivity. And we all already do this. Could you imagine if I was talking about cars, and I was like, my truck gets 650 miles per tank? You'd laugh at me. You're like, Joe, come on now. That's stupid. All tanks are different sizes. It's got a big tank. You know, we say miles per gallon, right? Miles per gallon, the numbers just change. We should all be driving BMW as set as at 70 miles per gallon. That's called efficiency. That's called productivity, right? We're doing this for a $3 commodity. Do this for your land. You only have one Manchester. So we've done this all across the country, and we see the same trends. For every dollar of county taxes somebody out in the county is paying to the county, their brother or sister inside the main city is paying about five times that to the same county. This is a Walmart, that's a mall, that's a two-story building. This is a three-story building, and that's a six-story building. And what you see is this an exponential jump as you start stacking those stories up. And it's kind of simple. Every story in this building is paying its own level of taxes on one piece of dirt. That's highly efficient. But the opposite is true. There's an incentive for me to waste your real estate. I'm not paying for the street that you put out there. You're just charging me based on value. Understand that. So in Asheville, we do these maps. We're kind of known for these maps. This is a, a map of value, the way that we typically look at value. This is 350 square miles. This is my county. Um, in gray, it's non-taxable. So this is a big, this is Mount Mitchell. This is the biggest mountain east of the Mississippi. The Blue Ridge Parkway comes through. That's all a park, it's not paying taxes. So just to be crude about it, it's a park, it's not giving me money, I don't care about it, right? In green, I have low value, and purple, I have high value. So this is low value. This big purple splotch right here, that's the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house. That one house is worth $100 million. Anybody have a $100 million house in this, in this room? Of course not. So when Bill Cecil shows up at one of our council meetings, we all genuflect and thank him for his time. His house is very valuable, but it's not a fair representation. His house is 180,000 square feet, and he's sitting on 2,000 acres of land. He's got the biggest gas tank. So let's do, rather than total value, let's do value per acre. The map just changed. So now this is productivity. So this is miles per gallon, right? Here it is in 3D. Can you all tell me where downtown Asheville might possibly be? Like you can see it clear as day, boom, this big purple spike right here. This is all downtown. This is our little sister of Black Mountain. This is a village of uh, 8,000 people that's about 10 miles away. You can see its Main Street popping up right there. Now we can also see things like this. This is a, a, a newer part of our community called Chun's Cove. It's a higher wealth neighborhood. It's actually less productive than the poorer neighborhood on the west side over here. You can see it in the data. We need to talk about the equity with, of that. The information is there, you can't escape it. Let's talk about productivity. So for you all, we did the same type of analysis. Um, so first of all, we had to figure out your taxes. Um, so we're a bunch of rubes from the mountains of North Carolina. We had to figure out your crazy tax cap and all that stuff. Our tax system is pretty simple. We have a market value. It gets a taxable reduction to a tax value. And then we multiply a tax rate, and boom, there's your tax bill. It's that simple. It's a straight line system. For y'all, you, you have a bunch of exemptions that your state puts into the system. Um, you know, if you have a disability or if you're elderly, all these sorts of discounts that you get baked in. Once those are removed from your value, you get your tax value, and then you multiply times your tax rate. Now, your tax rate is what you need in your budget that you've capped, uh, minus your non-property tax revenue divided by the city's overall assessed value. 
And that's the math that you use to come up with it. But basically the way that it comes out with is you have about 2% of taxes in both commercial and residential. Um, in some states we actually find that, like in Kansas, they tax residential half of what commercial is being taxed, which is kind of batty. But if you think about who's making policy, it's all voters, right? The commercial property owners, if they're in the town, they vote, but if they're not, they, they can't. So they have no representation. And we typically gouge commercial property owners because we assume that they're making more money. But anyway, you guys are straight. Um, so you're about $14,000 per $600,000 of value for both commercial and residential. Your county rate is extremely low. It's about 1.1 mils. So you guys, this is typical of New England. You, you don't charge a lot in your county system because your county doesn't do much. But it's still about $800 for both of those. So you put this cap on, and so we were trying to figure out, I don't know if you know about the tax cap, but you basically restricted your revenue growth um, and also was a, a, an effort to curb your spending. But basically you're looking at the average of spending over the last three calendar years adjusted for the consumer price index. Um, regardless of what happens with revaluation, you're averaging it out. But you also have this kind of ripcord that your, count, your alderman can pull that you can just vote against the cap, which you've been doing. Well, that should tell you that there's something wrong with that economic model. So this is just a simple chart to show your property levy, and you can see that it keeps on creeping up because your costs keep on creeping up. But here's what's going on with your property valuation. You see this kind of, this big convulsion that happens here. Well, that's the boom of the last, uh, and then the recession that brought things back. Now, your assessor is out doing these reevaluations at every five year intervals which you, you might end up missing some crazy stuff that happens in your economics. So this is realized they're just resetting value every five years, but you, they almost totally missed the recession right here. And then right in the middle of all this is when you dropped a cat tax cap into the whole thing. So if you just look at these charts, it's not consistent. So why would you put freezes in there? This is something y'all need to rethink. Is it worth it for you to have this artificial governor in your system that's behaving in a different way without looking at costs? And we'll come back to this in a second. So your land analysis, here's your county total value. So think of this as the miles per tank. You see the big parcels of land along 90, 93 right here, the big purple stuff. But again, this is total value. Rather than total value, here's value per acre. Um, and you can see the spots of Manchester up here and Nashua down here. Let me show it to you in 3D. So you can see Peterborough like way over here in the west, um, his, little, his little bump. But Manchester, y'all are doing awesome. Now, it was kind of fun to like hear some of the conversations of folks in the community that Nashua was doing great. And we're like, well, actually, Nashua is not. You can see how flat it is there. It may be rapidly growing. It may be horizontally spreading. There might be new development, but it's not a whole lot of wealth. You're getting a whole lot of yellow down there. And y'all have a big mountain range up there. So good on you, Manchester. You're doing awesome. Um, here's your city total value. Um, you can see, again, the parcels out by the highways. Here's value per acre. Now, all of a sudden, you see the heat over by the river over here, here you are in 3D. So you can see, again, if, imagine you're getting 2% of value, like a two mil thick blanket laid over this model. Where's your city producing all of its wealth? And you can see it in the big purple spike, um, as well as a spine along Elm Street. So speaking of which, let's go into the downtown for a second. Um, so you can see the, the, the spike along Elm Street, and you can see the mills aren't doing so bad. They're, they're pulling reds. Um, this is kind of a little weird, you've got like, a big surface parking lot right down the face of the river. Probably not the best use of public land. You might want to consider that, just saying. Um, but anyway, there's your mountain, um, and your mountain of value, here's your downtown. So you see that ridge along Elm Street. So even the, the, the City Hall Plaza, which is this big tall spike right here that goes off the top, even ignoring that, you have some pretty good value along this spine that, that is, is good. You have wealth here. Um, your county is about 18% non-taxable. That's parks, churches, schools, whatever. That's about average what we see for a lot of counties. Um, you know, you might want to look at out in the region, finding ways to hook up some of these parks to, to connect them so you have more of a natural path out there. Um, inside the city, you're about 30% non-taxable, which is about average. Um, and inside your downtown, you're about 33% non-taxable. This becomes a value statement. What do you want to have as a non-taxable property? Is it worth it to have non-taxable parking spaces right next to the river? If that's what y'all want, go for it. But it's not necessarily a good use of that land because you're not getting revenues out of it. Um, so be aware of, it's okay to have like a city hall or a town hall or a church. You actually have a facility there. When you have horizontal parking, you're essentially wasting horizontal pieces of territory. So your city is a, is a sharehold of your county 
is about 3% of the county's land area. It's about 20%. So for those of you that live in Manchester, you're about a one to seven ratio of productivity for the county. That's the wealth that you create for the county out of your taxes, right? As a shareholder to Hillsborough County. That's pretty good. Um, as a, as a, your downtown is a piece of your city. Um, it's about 2% of the city's footprint. It's about 8% uh, of the city's value. Um, which is which is good. It's not it's not awesome. I've we've, I've seen better, but it's because your housing value is kind of high um, inside your city. But it's basically a one to four ratio. But let's not forget that the downtown is a piece of the county, right? This where we're sitting in right now is paying county taxes, and it barely you can barely see it inside the county. It's about less than one tenth of a percent of the footprint. It's about two percent of the county's value. Those may not look like big numbers, but when you run the math on that, that's a one to twenty four ratio of productivity. So, so think of that. Imagine if we had 100 people in this book in this bookshop selling books, and one person's responsible for 24 times the, ta the the sales. How would you treat that person? You know, you you'd buy them a car or something. You're like, you're awesome, right? You need to think about the productivity. We need to have the county to the table to talk about this as well. So, running through some examples. Is this too nerdy for the end of the day? Are you guys all right with this? Um, running through some examples. Uh, while we started doing the study, um, and it's kind of funny, when we first started doing this presentation, everybody's like, well, this Walmart's dead, which totally makes our point, right? This, we, did, we started this when there was snow on the ground, and since then, the Walmart's passed away. Um, I think it died in June. So, and, it, and sure enough, we figured out when it was born. It was born in 1984, and it died in, in 2019. It actually, to a T, meets the prophecy of how Walmart's die. You have the example. Right? Did you all know that the average Walmart consumes more in police services than it pays in property taxes? Did you know that? Talk to a police officer, they'll tell you that. Actually, it was Bloomberg Magazine ran an analysis on it nationwide to prove that point. This is your community. If it's worth it for you to have 10 cents a roll of cheaper toilet paper to pay to police them, knock yourself out. I just want you to write this stuff down and make it a choice. We're never in the meetings when this happen happens. So your residential land uses, the average county resident, single family is about $100,000 of value per acre. Um, what was fun, this, this building caught fire while we were doing the study, and even the burnt building was pulling four times the average single family in the county. So just so you know. Um, anyway, the average city single family is about six times that. So y'all are six times the contributors to the county at single left family level versus your cousins out in the county. That's really productive. Um, now, we see things like this. This is on Scenic Drive at about a million dollars of value per acre. And we're always looking for things that are like these aha moments. And one of our favorites is this building here. This house over on Dover Street is three times the potency of this house on Scenic Drive. Do y'all know this house? Would you consider this a breadwinning neighborhood? It is. How, what's that? It's on the west side. Yeah, but it's a little house from the 1800s, and what it is, it's a dense little building on a small parcel of land. It's highly efficient. It's making use of its property. So there's incentives baked into our tax system to waste real estate, which is, again, your asset. So your multifamily in the county is about $400,000 on average. And again, remember, single family is 100000 on average. So multifamily is four times a tax contributor versus single family. That's the data. Um, when you get into the city, you find single family or you find multifamily inside Manchester limits. So now we're at like five million dollars on the right, the IKEA looking thing, uh, the Scandinavian building. Um, but your average in the city is about four million per acre. Now remember, single family was six hundred thousand. So when we talk about multifamily, we have to check our biases to the curb for a second and say. Is it producing wealth? Is it covering its share? And let's run the numbers and be agnostic about it, rather than saying, I'm an important person in my single family house, and I'm paying a lot of taxes, which you all do up here, but so does this stuff. So there's a term inside city planning called missing middle, that a lot of cities are trying to figure out how to get higher density stuff mixed in. And in New England, you guys are lucky because you actually have it all over the place. Your grandparents left it for you, like these triple deckers, pulling 2.3 million-ish in, in value per acre. Um, this is one of my favorites, the Winston Terrace, which is like three blocks this way. The Winston Terrace is pulling $2.4 million of value per acre. In the state that it's in, that's really cool. 
So think about that. It's 100 years old giving you this wealth for 100 years. That's pretty awesome. Um, this building here, the flats, is pulling 2.6 million. Um, your, your, your mill housing, that's just all like down over here, um, that stuff's averaging $4 million of value per acre. Would you assume that that's like four times a Walmart? It is. And it's been doing that for 100 years. Um, this thing, this, this old school that's been converted into apartments is about $7 million of value per acre, or seven times a Walmart. So that's some of the residential typologies when you get into commercial stuff. So here's the Whole Foods pulling about $900,000 of value per acre. So that's $900,000, right? That's 900,000, that's 7 million. Again, apples to apples. Get past your biases and understand what it is. So there's an incentive to basically spread out, waste the real estate, put down surface parking. It's, don't hate the player, understand the game. Is that worth it for you from an investment standpoint? In your dead boxes, they're a lot harder to convert. So we, and you find them littered all over your community, um, pulling between 500,000 and 300,000, 400,000. The Shaw's is kind of an anomaly, pulling at about two million. That was kind of a little weird, but it is what it is. Um, the Rite Aid across the river is about a million dollars of value per acre. That's actually more tax productive than the Whole Foods. Um, when you get into the stuff out at Hooksit, you're pulling about a million. Your, your Walmart's actually doing all right at 1.4 million. But again, remember, there is a trajectory of that Walmart. It has a pattern to it. Um, your Mall of New Hampshire, we were really excited that you guys creatively named this thing the Mall. Um, but the Mall <laughs> is about 2.8 million. It's really potent. This is one of the most potent malls that we've seen in the Mall of New Hampshire. Um, other commercial properties, uh, this was kind of interesting. We got this at 400,000. The Brady Sullivan Tower, which is just down the street, is only pulling about 2 million. And again, you go and you see a big building, but you're not seeing the massive expanses of parking and this huge, huge opportunity that's been liquefied in the process. You're paying for that street. You've got to plow it all, right? So when you, <clears throat> when you get into the taller buildings, you see, again, more, more potency, 11 million, 17 million. So the, even the smaller building is more potent than the tall building. So just you're going to see these numbers in there, uh, 16 million, 16 million. And then this stuff's killing it at 22 million, 20 million. Highly potent stuff that you've been able to produce. Um, we did find this one anomaly that you guys are whacking your utility company uh, to a pretty high degree at 23 million and 28 million dollar for your utility poles. Um, might be a problem in doing that because who pays the bill for that? Oh, that would be you all, right? Because where do they get their money? They're rate payers. So go ahead and hit them as hard as you want. They're going to turn around and charge you back that money. You might want to rethink that. Anyway, just putting that out there. Um, and then there's this guy. This is phenomenally potent at $68 million of value per acre. So that's the tallest purple spike in the model. Um, what's awesome about your community, and you know this, it's the stuff that makes your value, it's your authenticity, it's who you are, it's your history, your legacy. So just the building right next door is built in 1890 and it's pulling $8.5 million of value per acre. And it's not a skyscraper, it's just a, a five-story building. There are these people, these, this lost civilization of humans that built this for you had crazy technology called streetcars and horses when they built this thing. Like, can we seriously not do this anymore? Is that that hard? How do you make that happen? Think about your kids and your grandkids and what you leave them. So this building that we're in right now, the Bookery, is pulling about $6 million of value per acre. The Dancing Lion Chocolates, killing it, $6 million an acre. Who would have thought Dancing, Dancing uh, Lion Chocolates is like six times the value of a Walmart or three times the potency of, a, of a, the Mall of New Hampshire? Data. This is the information. Um, this building just up the street over here, the Pembroke Blocks, pulling $15 million of value per acre. Um, I don't know what happened there across the street. Uh, somebody did something, but we'll just take the main building. Um, $15 million of value per acre in, in that tower over here. And check this out, it's on a postcard. Could you imagine putting an office park on a postcard and saying, come to Manchester? But yet, yeah, we used to do this. We used to put creative pieces of architecture that were just commercial office buildings. We were proud enough to put them on a postcard. And again, there are horses in here when they did it, 1913. Think of the revenue that you have had to enjoy for the hundreds of years with this, or hundred and something years with this. 
So there is this legacy. Uh, your, your mills are pulling somewhere between 1.5 and $6 million of value per acre, which is potent, but there are also huge tracts of land. You have a lot of surface parking there. I'm not gonna bother going through this. These are charts and data that you'll have. And simply put, blue is single family, res or blue is residential, um, which you can see the single family down here. Red is commercial single use, and the boxes are of lower productivity than the, 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 the bigger stuff toward the downtown. Green is mixed use. So as you stack stories, as you mix uses, you actually see the potency drive up as you head into the downtown. Uh, we did have the mall, or sorry, the, uh, the City Hall Plaza building in there, but it kind of distorted the whole chart, so we removed that to do this, so just so you know. Um, but basically, two-tenths of an acre of the Pembroke block would equal the two-acre Rite Aid. Apples to apples, how you use land matters. Um, if you take the Dancing Lion, that's what the Dancing Lion looks like at the same scale as the Mall of New Hampshire. So if you had um, that many Dancing Lions, it would equal the Mall of New Hampshire. So 32 acres of the Dancing Lion would equal the 70 acre Mall of New Hampshire. Again, when you have a limited portfolio, how do you use that land? Think about it. Um, the, Pen the Beacon Building, if you had eight of them, it would equal the eight acre Brady Sullivan Tower just down the street. Again, apples to apples in productivity. Um, just to get a little nerdy for a second, if I haven't been nerdy enough, um, one of the things that we'll do with the, with the analysis is look at the behavior of the economics inside the dirt valuation. So when you pull your property tax bill, you're gonna see two numbers. You're gonna see the dirt value and you're gonna see improvement value. So with the computer, we can just turn off improvement value and just see the dirt, right? So this is Cheyenne, Wyoming. This is one of my favorites because it's absolutely obscene with the data. But up here in the upper left, you see, I don't know if you can see my cursor up here. This is the, how you expect your neighborhood to look. Everybody's kind of like light blue right there. Well, one of the things that we see are anomalies, like this little orange speck right here. That's an error. Either a human made it, the computer made it, or the math made it. But you shouldn't be that one person on the street that is so different from everybody else. But what I like about economic analysis is you find really weird gains in the math. Like this one here. See this big blue splotch right here? That's just dirt. So in the same zoning category, the same school district, same whatever, just crossing the street, we go from blue, which is $15,000, and it doubles in value to go to orange. Does, it, does anybody know how land doubles in value when you cross the street? Do y'all know this? So I was presenting at like 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I'm like, hey, how does land double when you cross the street? And the tax assessor was sitting in the front row, and she raises her hand, and she just belts out, you don't understand. And I was like, what am I missing? And she goes, well, these people over here on the north side, they, they have more land. The more land you have, the lower the value. Do y'all get that? I'm like, hold on a second. I get more land, you give me a discount? She goes, yeah, that's our standard. I'm like, okay. I've got three miles of frontage around this property, right? Three miles of road. This person's got two feet, two, 200 feet. So I've got many more times the road infrastructure. She goes, well, we don't count infrastructure as part of the investment. And I was like, so what you put into the ground, you don't want the money back? She goes, that's not, that's not part of our standard. So I get more stuff. Uh, this, there's, there's a bigger parcel here. I'm sure the planning director will agree I can put a bigger building right there. You can clearly see there's a mall on top of it, right? If I have a bigger building, don't I have more trips? More trips mean more car accidents, means more fire calls. Do you charge me for that? She goes, no, that's not part of our, our valuation more commerce because it's a bigger building, more theft, more police calls. Yeah, we don't count that either. The mayor was laughing so hard, he almost spat coffee out of his nose. He was just kept on laughing. I'm like, hold on a second. I get more stuff, you give me a discount. Does that work that way in any other kind of economic condition? If I get a bigger diamond, is it cheaper? If I have a bigger brick of gold, is it cheaper? And she goes, well, no. And I'm like, where did you get the standard? Oh, or sorry, their, their magazine is called Fair and Equitable, right? So that's the reason why I was at the assessor's conference was to ask them, is this fair and is it equitable? And they, they told me, they're like, it's not. I'm like, where'd you get the standard? Did Moses give it to you? Like, where'd this come from? <laughs> does it make any economic sense? They're like, it doesn't. Seriously, it's messed up. So if you wanna know how the market behaves, it's not an invisible hand making people do this stuff. You've put all sorts of economic incentives into the ground to waste your community. 
if that's the best use of your community, go for it, but make sure you're writing this stuff down to see if you can afford it. Don't assume that this is all thought through. So we did your land analysis, and let's just kind of zoom in on a couple. I'll just show you like an easy example. Right, right down in here, see how the out parcels, the little smaller guys, are so much more potent than the big ones next to it? What's up with that? And it's because you're following that economic model. Why do just a couple parcels of land in the downtown, why are they so much higher than everything else? Isn't it the same zoning category? So shouldn't we be looking at this stuff? This is just dirt, there's no buildings here, remember. So we have built cities, an economic model, without understanding the cash flow of it. And we just assume that it's all thought through. So jobs, we measured your jobs. It's actually your, your MSA, so that would include Nashua. Um, about 58% internal capture, where people don't leave the area. Well, that's pretty good. Um, inside Manchester, you're at about 38% just inside Manchester. So 38% of your residents don't leave the city, which is pretty good. You've got a lot of housing and internal capture with jobs, but you're also importing a bunch of people. Um, just for fun, we wanted to put you side by side with Nashua. I hope there's no Nashua people here. I hate to trash you guys so much, but it's, uh, you guys are killing them. So uh, you know, you've got a much bigger mountain than them. Be proud of that. Um, so they have 8% uh, more taxable real estate. This is them on the left and you on the right. So they actually have a head start. They have more taxable real estate than you do, but their average is about $100,000 less, let's call it $65,000 less than you. So you're actually averaging higher with less capacity and you have a much higher top value at about 67 million. So even if we remove the city hall plaza because how many of these towers can you have in your county? Your number two is still double their best one. So you're winning, good luck, that's awesome. Um, okay, just to close, how to figure out what to do and what you should be looking at. These are all things you need to pay attention to. So I'll give you some worst case scenarios. Peoria, Illinois, they told us they had a parking problem. So we're a bunch of map nerds, so we're gonna map it. So we're like, here's your water, here's your green space, here's your streets and sidewalks, here's all your surface parking, here's all of your buildings. Now of those buildings, these are all parking decks. So I said to them, it doesn't look like you got a parking problem, looks like you got a perception problem. You got plenty of parking all over the place. What are you complaining about? Now, I want you to understand what that means. Like, yeah, I'd love to have parking spaces everywhere. The same way I'd like to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. I think you should pay for that. Like, what kind of nonsense is that? It's all the stuff that we want. Well, what's the, what's the economics of this? So these are the actual numbers for Peoria. The average Peorian, there she is, has about 1,200 square feet of buildings dedicated to her and about 2.5 park, parking spaces across the whole county. So when the assessor goes out there after you build it, they're putting a price tag on this stuff, right? It's gonna get taxed. The average value per square foot of the building is about 35 bucks. The parking is pulling about a buck 40. Y'all follow me? That's the taxable value, and you're paying 2% on top of each of those. So the, this number is paying 27 times less taxes than that number. Y'all follow me? That's a subsidy because the cost of the infrastructure that runs in front of that whole thing is gonna cost you $9 a square foot in front of the building or in front of the parking. If your cost is consistent but your valuation is different, then that's a subsidy. Y'all follow me? That's the subsidy that's baked into parking. So when you look at the whole, the whole model, it drops off around downtown because there's a choker collar of parking all around it. Just walk, just walk two blocks in that direction. You'll start to see it. All around our downtowns, every American city has done that. We've drained our downtowns of its wealth. So when you go out to the burbs and you see how flat they are, it's because we've mandated parking out there. That's it. So we did their whole county this way. If you take all the buildings in the county and put them side by side, that's the footprint that you need of an entire county's worth of buildings. That's all you needed to do. But I understand, you don't want to, I don't want to be so close to you, I want a dog or something, I want to stretch out. We're America. But when you stretch out, you need parking and you need roads. That's the footprint of those. So we have actually more land area dedicated to parking than buildings. This is your liability, this is everything else. Here are the numbers. We do it on a per square mile basis. You have a billion dollars of value per square mile out of the buildings. This stuff's only pulling you 40 million and this is costing you 250 million. Those roads have a cost. This is everything else. That stuff doesn't pay anything. So what ends up happening, the first question we need to ask ourselves is why doesn't the cost of 
parking pick up the cost of the road? We know who's using both of them, that would be cars, right? So it seems like the car stationary should pay for the car moving. Why don't those numbers match? But we don't do the math on that stuff. So what ends up happening is we drain our savings fund that could go to after school programs, parks, whatever, but instead we have to keep on fixing streets because the streets need to be plowed and they need to be fixed. Do y'all follow me? So they have enough roads to go from Peoria to Vancouver. Do y'all know how much roads you got? Hold on, I'll show you. So this is all spatial analysis. You have to be spatially literate to understand this stuff. You need to look on the ground and see what's going on. That joke only works for people over the age of 35, by the way, but um, anyway. We, I'm not gonna go through all these maps, but we did a similar spatial analysis of you all. We'll have the data for you and, and what we have, but basically this is your entire city. Notice how much roads you've got compared to your buildings. That's your liability, that's your expense. The buildings and the parking is what paying your taxes. But your numbers, the way that they work out is you're pulling about $90 a square foot in your buildings. You have much more potent buildings than Peoria, but and you also have a lot less parking. So good on you for having less parking, but it's still only pulling a, a buck 20 in, in value. And that's the Pearl Street lot. That's like your best parking lot in the entire city. As you go further away from the city, the value drops. That's your, that's your big breadwinner. Your cost of your roads are about $20 a square foot. Is this gonna work out for you? I don't know, gotta do the analysis on that. So looking at your roads and also looking at your history, we had a lot of fun pulling these different impact moments. The Amiskag is, is probably your biggest moment in 1911 when that came in and it completely changed who you were. So there's a pre-Amiskag and post-Amiskag moment that we measured. The blue stuff is all everything that was built before 1911, which is a lot of your city. So you have these two different cities. We just use that as a snap point to figure out what happened. There's what your great grandparents left you, which doesn't look a lot because it's being dwarfed by this stuff. And then there's what you built after that, right? When you look at the numbers, before 1911, your average value is pulling about a million dollars an acre. Everything you've done since then is actually less than that. So yes, you've got this massive tower down the street that's super awesome but how many more mi square miles of surface parking lot and strip mall did you build that liquidated that? And those are your numbers. This is super fun. Um, I'm gonna play this. This is an animated growth model of how your community grew. And you can see you didn't really exist until the Civil War, then all of a sudden you guys go crazy and you build a city up until 1925 that's pretty compact. And I was blown away at how you grew after World War II, look at this. Look at how much more of your community you built post-war. And I had a Southern bias that you were an old place, that you existed for a long time, but I'll just run this through again so you can see it. It's kind of wild to me. So as you stretch out, you're, you're adding a development pattern. You're also adding many more miles of roads from here forward uh, as you go forward. So anyway, we'll have a copy of that for you. But blue, this, this purple line right here is your population growth. So you can see what happened from 1875 to 1925. So in that 50 year period, look at the amount of community people you added right here. That's your population surge that happened in the early 1900s, which is a rapid, rapid growth in population. And look what you added in streets down here. What's crazy is from 1925 to 1975, this is actually your problem. Now, again, it's a lot of communities did this. We just came back from the war and just went kind of crazy. But you added very few people. You see how slow that slope is. But look at how much more miles of road you added over that period in those two purple spots. So this is what your great grandparents had for roads. And then you added a little bit of people, but look at how much more roads you added. Did you follow me? So let's kind of zip ahead here. There's a problem with this because this is a cyclical cost that's gonna keep on coming. Every 50 years, those roads need to be rebuilt, right? So in 1925, you had 9.6, let's call it 10 feet of road per person. You grew your population, 211,000 people. This is the amount of road per person you have today. You've doubled your area of road. So you grew your population 44%. You grew your liability or your roads 163%. That's a huge wave. This is, what happened in 1975 is gonna be haunting you in this next five years for the rebuild of all of that stuff. 
Now, we did this analysis in Lancaster, California. I'll just give you a, a, a worse example of this. Lancaster is up and over the mountain from Los Angeles. Uh, this is their city from an economic standpoint. They have one building in their downtown that's three stories tall. There are 160,000 people, their biggest buildings, the three-story building you can see it on the map. Not good, they mostly grew after World War II. But what they have is 926 miles, or 953 miles of road. That's how much road they have, which will go from Portland to Los Angeles. Um, this is when their roads were built, starting in 1910, or the early 1900s. They went on a little road building spree and then went to sleep. But after World War II is when they did the majority of their growth. And you can't help but notice what happened in 1953 with all of those lane miles that happened in that big spike right there. Well, guess what? When your grandparents did that, that comes back to haunt your parents' generation 40 years later with the first rebuild. Now, when cities are hit with this huge capital cost, what do city councilors do? They need money, right? So most of them usually let out more development and get new tax base. And when you do that, sometimes you take down more roads. They added more roads. So we froze them here and said, look, here's what's going to happen. This is going to come back to haunt you with the second rebuild, and it's going to bring along with it the new stuff. So here's what your build-rebuild cycle looks like. Do you notice a pattern? That first wave was kind of silly. We just did it because we're new now. We're a new America. Well, guess what? We went ahead and repeated it. And now it's doubling down and it's capitalizing on itself and getting bigger and bigger. Every American city is going through this right now because no one tested out this whole post-war development thing. We didn't, no one on the planet had tried this before, but every American city just went for it. We're dealing with it now. So they can only afford about 50% of their roads based off their revenue that they have right now. Um, you all are kind of in a similar situation. You have enough roads to go from Manchester to Orlando. Did you know that? You have more roads than them. And your less population. There are facts. You have to deal with them. This isn't going to go away. That wave is going to keep on hitting you. So if you're not measuring this stuff, you can't manage it. If you don't look at the data, you're flying blind. You have to pay attention to this stuff. If you don't have the money for the Greenway, the art teacher, the dancing traffic cop, I haven't seen a dancing traffic cop yet. It's not that you don't have the money. It's that it's buried in a system that's draining your wealth. Just make sure you can afford it. So your city's $8.5 billion of value. That's your taxable value of your community. So you guys are like two and a half pats of value, if you want to look at it that way. Um, your county is about 8.1 pats in value at, at uh, 30, let's call it $37 billion. You know your elected officials. Are they qualified to run a multi-billion dollar corporation? Are you helping them understand the data that's there? We need to understand this stuff. So I can tell you that Mr. Kraft knows Tom Brady's towel bill. I can tell you that cups in our nightclub cost five cents a pop. You need to understand what a pipe costs, what a road costs, and how to pay for it. So I understand this is depressing. Uh, in several of the presentations in the last couple of days, one of the things that we've heard from folks time and time again is like, this is, this is crazy. Give me three things that I could do. OK. What first thing is you need to rethink that cap. This cost that you did in those, all those new lane miles in the 1970s is coming due. It's not going to behave in a cap environment. It's got to get fixed. That's a reality. You have to think of the economic, because I'm not saying go out and just blow all of your money, but you need to understand the economics of all of this stuff and how it's linked geographically. Know your costs and map them. I've just given you your revenue side. Dig deep and do the costing side. Put the stuff on a map. A mile of pipe is a mile of pipe. So we did this in Eugene, Oregon. This is their revenue model. This is the whole city floating in the lake. Green is their money coming out of the ground. Red is the cost of the development patterns. So you want to choose to live way out here. This is what you're paying in taxes. This is what you're costing society. There's a reality to that. Make sure you're running your costs against your revenues so you can see what's in the black and what's in the red. And be honest with each other. We have to pay for this stuff. So this is their revenue model of productivity. If you lift, lift this up and look underground, you can see the death by a 1,000 cuts. This is all stuff that we know. This is, this, is data that, this is data that we have. Pay attention to it. So in their case, and again, this is just breaking down the typologies of residential um, 
mixed use and commercial. We call this the Brady Bunch slide. We have low density, medium density, high density. This is their numbers. So basically the average single family house that's detached is upside down about $1,400 per acre. And that's the reality of what they're dealing with. We're not saying don't do housing, but just understand that number. When you have 80% of your land use is in a deficit, can you carry that cost? Maybe you need to do a little bit more of the other stuff to start to, to compensate. And we tell people, like, look, we, we're not saying don't buy a house. Buy your house, but understand that you need to do other things to keep you in balance. So you need to do more of the dense stuff for a little bit. So maybe out here, you see up, up there on the top, that little thing is a signal. Why don't you just do like four more of those in the community somewhere and grow some wealth? Just get yourself out of that hole. Geo account, take your costs, put it on a piece of paper, be adults about it. It's going to cost money. Things, things have costs. Um, so your accountant doesn't care if you, you buy a boat, right? Your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. Make sure that you can afford this stuff. So pipes. This is their, storm, their, their sewerage system in Eugene. These are all the different basins in different colors. And you can see this basin has no lift stations in it. This basin has eight lift stations. Lift stations are really expensive. That's where you're lifting your sewerage uphill. We asked them, we're like, are these people paying the same price every time they flush their gallon of, of sewerage at the same cost? And they said yes. And we're like, well, the, these people have a lot more costs up here, so they carry that. Or at least talk about it and just say, look, we're subsidizing lift stations. And just make a conscious choice. But we see when you look at two districts, on the left, they're less dense. So you have one half the people, but you have double the amount of feet of pipe per person. So when you have more pipe and less people, that's a subsidy. So you're getting a, a lot more value out of the people on the right, yet the cost of service on the left is double the cost. Pay attention to these numbers, and again, write them down, can you afford that? You should be doing this with your sewer and water as well. So put your numbers on a map. It's happy, be happy about it. See your data. I'll recommend this book. I've recommended this book on all the talks. Chuck Marone, I don't know if you know Chuck, in Strong Towns. This book is awesome. He covers a lot of this data and the economics we need to be looking at. Read the book. Um, it'll only take a few hours. And he's, have him come to town as well. And uh, thank you. Do your math.